and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, apparently. Do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, uh, suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello, good afternoon, welcome to GB News Sunday. I'm Emily Carver. For the next two hours, I'll be keeping you company on TV, online and digital radio. So coming up on the show today, are Labour election rigging? Starmer's under fire for reportedly planning to give the vote to 16 and 17 year olds, as well as EU nationals. Hmm. Prison officers have been told to stop calling criminals convicts because it's offensive is the prison service the latest casualty in the woke wars and brace yourself for this one net migration may hit one million this year have we completely lost control of our borders more on all of that after the news headlines with rory thank you very much emily the latest from the gb newsroom Nurses are calling for a double-digit pay offer to prevent further strike action. The head of the Royal College of Nursing, Pat Cullen, told the Sunday Times the government risks another six months of industrial action if negotiations aren't reopened. 
Well, members rejected a 5% offer, which was accepted by 14 other unions. A new ballot for strikes will be held later this month. Residents in North Devon told us the need to consider the current economic climate. I do believe they are worth every penny of 5%, but um, whether they're worth more, I think probably yes. Well, we definitely need them, and we need the health service. It's being run down by this government, which can't blame them for COVID because it's a new disease, but the rest of it, they mucked up. I think they should accept the offer that's on the table because we're all suffering from the cost of living crisis. And as a pensioner, although we've had a big rise this time, it's probably not going to last and we're affected by everything as well. Suggestions of unrest within the Conservative Party are being downplayed after the Prime Minister was blamed for the recent local election results. Rishi Sunak is facing criticism after nearly 1,000 councillors were lost and the decision to scale back post-Brexit plans to scrap EU laws. Former Home Secretary Priti Patel accused the leader of failing to listen to his own party, adding the Tories hadn't covered itself in glory since Boris Johnson's leadership, while Energy Secretary Grant Shapps says the PM is doing the right things and people just need to be patient. I think this, and she was referring to this set of elections, um, which were obviously very uh, difficult for the Conservatives. There weren't a good set of elections for us. Um, but this is the first opportunity people have had to comment on all the shenanigans of last um, summer and those le many leadership changes that went on. I think people were venting their frustration. I actually think that Rishi Sunak, in his five-point plan to halve inflation and grow the economy and reduce uh, our debt and cut the NHS waiting list and stop the small boats, I think he's doing exactly the right things. And let's judge him against that. Let's judge this government against that when it comes to the next election. In other news, the Shadow Business Secretary has defended plans to give workers the right to switch off outside of working hours. Labour wants to restrict employers from contacting staff by phone or by email, saying workers should be able to disconnect from devices in their downtime. Well, similar leg legislation is already in place in France. Jonathan Reynolds told us it will promote productivity. I think we do want to see uh, the kind of employment laws that will protect family life, give people some time uh, in order to do the other things that are important in life as well as work. I think that's been eroded very significantly in recent years. I think uh, the labour market itself means that more people want flexibility in the workplace, but I'm absolutely confident in the, the aggregate platform we'll put forward is the one that will give people hope and optimism and turn this country around after 13 years of Conservative government. Meanwhile, the party says it has plans to create 80,000 new jobs in the car industry. Labour says it will part finance eight factories to achieve its goal. It will also help to power nearly two million electric vehicles. It says the proposal will see the West Midlands benefit from 28,000 jobs and 11,000 roads will be created in the North West. Turkey is bracing itself for possible protests or clashes with voting underway in the presidential election. People across the country, including President Erdogan, are heading to polling stations in the first round of the vote. The leader faces the biggest political challenge of his career, seeking re-election after 20 years in power. Well, opinion polls show it will be tight, though, with a clear indication of the result expected by this evening. Liverpool is being seen as the big winner after hosting the Eurovision Song Contest, with the Prime Minister saying the city has done the UK and Ukraine proud. Swedish pop star Lorraine made history, becoming the only woman to win the event twice. The country now ties with Ireland for the most song contest victories, both claiming seven titles. The UK's entry, May Muller, finished second last behind Germany. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now, though, back to Emily. Thank you, Rory. So let's go straight to the latest in Westminster. So Sir Keir Starmer has been accused of wanting to rig future general elections by changing who's allowed to vote. Leaked policy plans reveal Labour is considering giving the vote to EU nationals as well as 16 and 17 year olds. The proposals have sparked accusations that Keir Starmer is in fact trying to rig the outcome of future elections. 
and that that move could be a new bid to roll back Brexit. So let's see what Tom Harwood, our deputy political editor, thinks about this. It's a really interesting proposal and it's unusual in the sense that this is actually one of the election pledges on which Sir Keir Starmer stood back in 2020 that he's actually sticking by. Mm. If we remember back to that leadership election and the 10 pledges that Sir Keir Starmer made, whether it was to abolish tuition fees or nationalise mail, rail and the rest of it, uh, and, and, and uh, keep free movement with the European Union, he's U-turned on every single one of those pledges apart from this one, this leaked document, reveals. And this is to give those with so-called st settled status in the United Kingdom the right to vote in general elections. The Scottish Parliament has already done this. So in, in Scotland, if you're a migrant who hasn't become a citizen of the United Kingdom, you can still vote uh, in uh, those devolved elections, but you can't in general elections. Mm. And that would be the change that the Labour Party would make if this leaked document uh, becomes the actual policy prospectus for the Labour Party. Those who have uh, made their lives in the UK but decided for whatever reason to not become a British citizen being able to vote. And that's millions of people. I think the EU national question, we're going to be debating this later in the show, so do stay tuned for that, because we have two very different views on whether this is a good thing and should happen. But 16 and 17-year-olds, you don't have to be a great cynic to, to think why Labour would want to do that. Well, looking at the way that the vote has become stratified, stratified by age, mm. it is now more stratified than it has ever been by age. It's very often the refrain that younger people tend to be more liberal and older people tend to be more conservative. But actually, there are many examples of elections in history where, for example, Margaret Thatcher won the 18 to 24 uh, voter demographic it's in It's amazing to think that, isn't it? it? It's remarkable. You can see, for example, young conservative rallies back from the 1980s. <laughs> Where, uh, it was young, cool to be a Conservative. Where, where, uh, I'm not going to go that far, <laughs> but certainly less uncool than it seems today. Um, and, and so it is interesting that as uh, voting has become more stratified by age, we've seen left-wing parties lean into this idea of lowering the franchise to a relatively arbitrary figure. Of course, it's interesting because in almost every other element of life, 16-year-olds uh, and 17-year-olds have got fewer rights. Uh, for example, the way that uh, they can... Uh, you, you now have an expectation to stay in full-time education or mm. training in a way that you could... Uh, that, that did not exist only a few years ago. People used to leave school at 16. Now that's a lot harder to Yes, do. you can't actually be an adult now at the age of 16, 17. You can't. You can't be in full-term employment. And you can't get married anymore at that age either. There are so many different elements that we've been hearing and whether it's about these proposals to raise the smoking age to beyond 18 or, or uh, change the way that someone can achieve a driving licence until the age of 25. <laughs> in so many different elements of life, we've been saying that children should have fewer rights and that younger people should have fewer rights, apart from this one. And it does seem that there's a striking inconsistency there. Also, with, obviously, the Labour Party spoke out against uh, voter ID because they argued that this was an attempt by the Conservative Party to suppress the vote. Well, you could argue that this is also an effort to manipulate the results of a future general elections anyway, in a different way, but similar outcomes perhaps in other directions. Now, it's not all plain sailing in the Conservative Party. Yesterday there was a conference in Bournemouth. There was the Conservative Democratic Organisation, what some people have perhaps cynically called the foot soldiers of <laughs> Boris Johnson, those who would really rather see uh, Rishi Sunak turfed out of number 10. Now, I must stress that the speakers at this conference really did not say that that was uh, what they were there to do. For example, Jacob Rees-Mogg was saying we really have to stick with Rishi Sunak because mm. it would be farcical to change leaders yet again. However, those who have been reporting on the ground there have been saying there is a, an over overwhelming mood that uh, the direction the Conservative Party has gone in is the wrong one, that it was a massive mistake to get rid of Boris Johnson. And if anything, we're seeing a growing caucus now of people and influential voices within the Conservative Party trying to contribute to that battle of ideas and perhaps even organising for what the party might look like come a potential election loss. Yes, it's very interesting. Um, in the sun this morning, 
they're going big on Pretty Patel. Apparently, she's going to war with Rishi Sunak, and this is over the uh, how Boris Johnson was ousted from the party, in her view. But also, interestingly, in, if I can just keep you for another minute, in the Express, I don't know if you've seen this morning, but big. Uh, Brexiteers, David Davis, um, Andrea Leadsom and Liam Fox have all written a column, a joint column, in support of Kemi Badaknock's decision to U-turn on the repealing of all EU legislation. Yes, it is an interesting one, this, because it's a change in approach. Now, people around Kemi who uh, are, cannot be doubted in their Brexiteer credentials, especially some of her advisers, have been saying that actually this is a better way to get rid of EU law uh, in a more methodical way, to focus on that which should be removed rather than that which should be kept. However, those uh, around Jacob Rees-Mogg, who of course drew up the legislation originally, say something very different, and that's that the reason there was this sunset clause there is to work uh, with the impetus of the civil service, which is often the impetus of the civil service is to keep things the same. That's mm. uh, to, to, to not really upset the apple cart. Therefore, having uh, uh, this, this, this sunset clause in the legislation means if they want to keep anything, they have to work really hard to keep it. Yeah. Whereas flipping that round as it now has been flipped, whereby you have to work really hard to remove something, otherwise everything is kept, you can sort of see how the status quo bias might then keep us closer to that EU regulatory orbit. Yes, and it's that rather controversial debate over whether Whitehall in itself is uh, causing some of the inertia here. But we'll get on to that again later in the show. We'll be debating that too. Thank you very much indeed, Tom Harwood, our deputy political editor, bringing up us up to speed on what's going on in the wonderful and weird world of Westminster. So, net migration, our big story of the day. In the UK this year could reach one million people. That's more than 45,000 migrants arrived on small boats in 2022. Over 6,800 have crossed the channel this year. That's a tiny fraction of the total number of people who are settling in the UK each year. The figures are looking pretty startling. So joining me now is co-founder of Navara Media, Aaron Bastani, and GB News presenter, Patrick Christie. Thank you very much to you both for joining me this afternoon. Aaron, I'll start with you. What do you make of these figures? They are projections, but it looks highly likely that we're going to have net migration in the very high hundreds of thousands. Well, what do I make of them? Like you say, it's important to uh, state at the top that we won't know the actual figures for this until the end of the month. Um, and these are projections that have come out from a think tank, but they, they broadly seem correct if you look at the data underpinning them. Uh, the Telegraph did a good piece on this actually earlier on in the week. Most of the people of that 650,000 to 1 million figure, most of them are people coming here as students and their dependents. After that, you've got people who are coming here for work, and their dependents. Uh, and then you have people here who are uh, migrating to the UK as a result of family issues. So maybe they've married a British national or it's the, you know, it's the, it's the daughter or the son of a, Brit of a new, newly naturalized British national. And then at the top, you really have, apart from Ukrainians, a very small slither of people coming over as refugees. It should be said, I was actually shocked at how few Afghans were included in that figure. You've got approximately 200,000 Ukrainians. That's really overwhelmingly where uh, asylum seekers, those uh, fleeing uh, political volatility and whatnot are are coming from it's from ukraine so it was shocking to me and i think for your viewers they will remember that famous line from david cameron in 2010 we will reduce immigration to the tens of thousands and yet we're at a million and i suppose the, the question i throw over to you and to patrick is you know the tories love to say well can you imagine what it would be if it was labor well the the kinds of net migration we're seeing this year and last year whether you agree with it disagree with it, whatever it's unprecedented and it's nothing like what we saw with labor from 1997 to 2010 I think that's absolutely right. Patrick, a lot of people voted yeah. to remove new Labour from government because they were unhappy with <laughs> the staggering levels of immigration. Then what do you see? Well, you see successive Conservative <laughs> governments absolutely give up, it seems, on trying to bring those levels down and skyrocketing potentially to one million. It is a bit of a slap in the face to people who put their trust in, in the government yeah. to reduce those levels. 
No, it absolutely is. And Aaron, on that, is completely right. I mean, if the Conservatives, maybe one of the things that they had was, oh, we'll be tougher on immigration. Well, that's completely gone. And I think a lot of people are going to just roll over now and say, well, there is nothing. There's a Rizzler paper between the Labour Party and the Tories when it comes to immigration. And arguably, well, definitely, actually, the Tories' track record on it is even worse. And I think that is pretty shocking. More so than that, for me, it's the lies. OK, and it is the abject lies. We've been lied to about the desire to reduce net immigration to the tens of thousands. On top of that as well, we are, in my view, lied to about, about student visas. They say that only a small minority overstay their visa or legally choose to remain. That's the claim that makes it more palatable to people when figures like these predictions drop that say roughly around 500,000 students are predicted to arrive this year. But the Office for National Statistics says that there are no official figures that show how many students do not emigrate and remain in the UK. And indeed, every single year since 2012, when, as we all know, immigration, net migration was a lot lower, around 100,000 more student immigrants arrived than emigrated from the year before. So if you magnify that out, that is a huge number. We've spoken a bit about their dependents as well. Sometimes they can bring as many as four dependents over. But for me, it is not just about these numbers that we're talking about here and, and the way it looks on a spreadsheet. I'm sure we're going to get stuck into the economic angle of it. But just quickly, I'd like to talk a little bit about something I would argue as being a bit more important, really, which is things like culture, way of life and rapid demographic change. And it is a human instinct to want to preserve where you live. People oppose HS2 or planning developments, for example, because they don't want their area to change. And so if it's socially acceptable to want to block a new housing development because you don't want your area to change, I think it has to be socially acceptable to say, I would really prefer it if my town didn't suddenly become minority British. And I think it's a, it's a problem, really. It's a problem that mm. not enough people think or that are, are vocal enough about that. Yes, Patrick, I, I think that's certainly true. Aaron, what do you say to that? Because a lot of people who have been concerned by immigration levels, you know, we talk about it in terms of economics, but actually, deep down in people's hearts, they are concerned because the country that they grew up in, perhaps, doesn't look like how it used to. Is that a nasty, horrible thing to say or point out? Well, there's a few things I want to pick up. So firstly, on the economy, because, of course, that's the, that's the argument that's been made for, for large scale immigration in, in mm. recent decades. It's, it's great mm. for the economy. We, we, we don't I don't think we need to necessarily touch on that for the moment. I think when we're talking about the economy, what's striking with this data is we're looking at growth this year of about 0.3 percent, 0.4 percent. Let's be optimistic, say 0.5 percent, 0.6 percent. But we've got a million mm. people coming in. What that means is that GDP per capita, that means GDP per person is, is absolutely going down. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a political incentive here for the part the government to actually have as many people coming in as possible to massage the GDP figures to say, well, look, Absolutely. we're not in a recession. It's very hard to well, be in a Liz recession Trust when you have practically an extra million admitted people. That. Liz Truss practically admitted that was the case because, Aaron, you're, you're on, the, on the left economically. Uh, people, people, people continue to say, what did you say? Just a bit. Just a bit, just a bit. You're on the left. Um, people say, you know, it's essential to have immigration for economic growth. You've just countered that with the point that, yes, in terms of GDP, it looks like it, but not when it comes to per capita. Do you think that mass immigration has led to the stagnation of wages, has stopped our economy from becoming more productive in other ways, and that we're actually just taking advantage of people coming over from India, Pakistan, wherever it is, to work those menial jobs um, for us. It doesn't seem like a very sustainable way of running your economy, does it? So on the one hand, I think the fact we had large scale immigration after 2004, particularly from Central and Eastern Europe, I think that's a big reason why we have low inflation in this country uh, after then. It's not the only reason, but you know, also I think China making loads of cheap stuff for the whole world is another reason. But we had low inflation for about 15 years until the last couple of years. And, and a big reason why was you know, immigration into the labor market, particularly for things like agricultural goods, food processing, building, et cetera, et cetera, construction. So that's one thing. It's helped keep inflation low. And of course, politicians say we like to keep inflation low. I think it really doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's, let me give you a counter example here. So China, for instance, has around 1.1 million people, even now, going mm -hmm. from country to city every year. And that's a high growth economy. It's becoming a more innovative economy because of what that looks like. So you can see a world where we have very large immigration in this country, mm -hmm. and it still leads to high GDP, high growth, rising productivity. Mm -hmm. 
it's, it's plausible in the realms of abstraction. I mean, look at somewhere like mm. Dubai or the UAE, you know, it's an economic powerhouse off, off the back of immigration. However, that isn't the model that we've had but you have over the last massive... 20, 25 mm. years. You have absolute massive inequality mm. in places like Dubai, of course, places like Hong Kong, you have practically an, an underclass doing all of the menial, mean, menial jobs, you might call them. Patrick, coming back to basically the Western world's reaction, Europe's reaction, mm. I don't know if you've seen, but Germany are very much looking to abandon that open door policy that Angela Merkel yeah. brought in during the migration crisis. Um, when she essentially flung open the doors to people from Syria and from all over all of the all over the world, really, it turned out. Do you think that we're risking some we're risking a backlash here with these with these figures? Yeah, no, one hundred percent. We are risking a backlash here. Now, I want to preface what I'm about to say by saying that look, in the round, clearly migration to Britain has been a good thing, and certainly you don't just, by the way, have to be white in order to be British. That's his stating the bleeding obvious, but I wanted to say that in case there are some kind of weird Twitter backlash. But the demographics to this, I was speaking to a, a demographic expert on my show uh, earlier in the week. He said that Britain by 2050 is predicted to be 50% white, roughly around 85% now, and 75% non-white in primary schools by 2050. Now, this indicates clearly a very rapid and very strong cultural change, and dare I say it, religious change as well. And the evidence of how integration hasn't necessarily always worked is plain to see in places like Bradford, Rusholme, Wakefield, etc. We all know the kind of areas around the UK. So rapid, high-speed yeah. population growth that involves different cultures and different religions, who are, by the way, very keen. And in some ways, I've got massive respect for them because I wish that, that British people were keen as keen to cling on to their culture as some people coming from different parts of the world. But People who are very keen to cling on to their cultures, then therefore, obviously, can end up dominating areas. Yeah. And that can be a real risk. But, you know, it's not so much just about this, you know, racial differences or anything like that, or religious differences or cultural differences. I really do think it's the pace of it. It's the absolutely rapid pace of it. And when you look at those demographic predictions, it is reasonable to suggest that we have already reached the point yeah. of no return there. Yeah, um, Aaron, just very lastly, to that point, you, you, I don't think you, you answered that point earlier in the discussion. Do you think that it is a problem that we're seeing such rapid cultural change in this country? Well, I think what matters is, do, do voters think it's a problem? You know, I mean, I, I can give my two bobs worth. Do you Aaron, does it worry you? Does it worry you? I mean, it depends where. For instance, I disagree with 300 people being dumped in a small village uh, who are claiming asylum. I think if if London has an extra 100,000 people who are brown or black, I don't think that makes the slightest difference. So, in terms of in terms of migrants going to larger cities with high population density, already very mixed. I don't think. I frankly think very few people would notice. I, and I think this actually gets to the core of what happened with Brexit. Lots of people said, oh, well, the places with the least immigration are the most racist. They oppose Brexit. But you look at someone like Boston, for instance, the capital of Brexit. Yes, it had. It was still very white. But actually, it's seen the most demographic change after 2004. Mm. So even though it was still very white, still seemingly very homogenous, it had changed a great deal. And I think what we're seeing now with this wave is a bit different. I mean, let's see. But because of the educational kind of element to it, these people are generally gravitating towards university towns, larger cities, places which, let's be honest, are more comfortable with demographic change and, and the pace of demographic change. So yeah. I'm not making any conclusions off the back of that, but I think that looks a little bit different to say Central Eastern Europeans going to Boston or Bognor or Skegness um, in the mid 2000s. Yeah, well, what we do know is that this is going to be a massive headache for the government to try to explain these figures to the public who thought that they were trying to bring the numbers down anyway, perhaps naively. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Aaron Bastard co-founder of Navara Media and GB News presenter there, Patrick Christie's, talking us through those potential net migration figures that we're facing, up to one million. This is GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver. Coming up on the show, the younger royals stepped up to the plate during the coronation, so is the firm's future in safe hands. Stay with us. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. 
People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back to GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver, on your TV and digital radio. So, after last week's stunning display of pomp and pageantry, all eyes are now on the younger members of the royal family as they gear up for their roles in the new royal era. The Princess of Wales put in a special surprise appearance for Eurovision last night. Let's have a quick listen. Along with their parents, George and Charlotte and Louis are also taking on a bigger role as they begin to partake in royal duties, representing the firm's future. So joining me now is Richard Fitzwilliams, royal commentator. Richard, there, you heard my intro there talking about the younger royals. Are they actually, you know, stepping up to the plate already? Well, I think one of the problems, and this is something that King Charles is going to have to deal with, the, as we saw on the in the first set of photographs, which was released after the highly successful coronation weekend, uh, we saw there were 12 working members of the royal family, of which only four were below the age of 70. So this does raise the point. Mm. Firstly, you showed a charming a fair clip of uh, William and Catherine, and also, of course, George and uh, Charlotte and Louis, and they played a role of one sort or another in the different days in the uh, during the uh, coronation weekend. I mean, it was wonderful to see George as a page of honour, but it is obviously going to be a long time before any of them are able to participate in royal mm. engagements actively. And this does, it, it does mean that firstly, the 
the Waleses are the future of the monarchy. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But secondly, who's going to take up all these hundreds of patronages at the moment, which are at the moment vacant, which used to have, say, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen, uh, King Charles, when Prince of Wales, or indeed Andrew? I'm interested in how William and Catherine handle the limelight on their three children, because at the moment they're pictured on these... Uh, they've been in, at these nice outdoor events, obviously at the coronation itself, but then doing outdoor events, helping out with things, you know, smiling for the camera, getting on, tasting some s'mores, I think Prince Louis was doing, for example. These are all quite simple things. When they start to get into their adolescence, how, how does the royal family handle that? Oh, I think it's, there's absolutely no question that you've not only got youth, but also adolescence that they have a right to privacy. So mm. what you do, you balance the uh, amount of exposure. I mean, Catherine, for example, probably take a photograph on birthdays. You'll see them on Christmas cards, and you would see them as you have uh, from time to time in recent full-scale royal events. But so far as the average day-to-day -day activities are concerned, I mean, there's a the spotlight is is ferocious, we know that, and privacy comes first. And I think William and Catherine have been absolutely exemplary in that. But in adolescence, that isn't likely to change that much. And also remember that going on to university and so forth, as William and Catherine at St Andrews were, um, there were that privacy was was guarded. So you will see the same as you would naturally expect to for any student. Of course, they're not anybody, but it's, it's so important that they have as normal an adolescence and childhood as possible. Yes, it must be hard at, at the age they're at at the moment to understand truly their position in society. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining me, Richard Fitzwilliam, their royal commentator. Thank you very much indeed. This is GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver. Still to come, Labour could make working from home a basic right for British workers. But is this evidence of our lazy mentality? And what would it mean for the economy? We've got more on that after the news with Rory. Thank you very much, Emily. The latest from the GB Newsroom. Nurses are calling for a double-digit pay offer to prevent further strike action. The head of the Royal College of Nursing, Pat Cullen, told the Sunday Times the government risks another six months of industrial action if negotiations aren't reopened. Members rejected a 5% offer, which was accepted by 14 other unions, while a new ballot for strikes will be held later this month. Suggestions of unrest within the Conservative Party are being downplayed after the Prime Minister was blamed for the recent local election results. Rishi Sunak is facing criticism after nearly 1,000 councillors were lost and the decision to scale back post-Brexit plans to scrap EU laws. Former Home Secretary Priti Patel accused the leader of failing to listen to his own party, adding the Tories hadn't covered itself in glory since Boris Johnson's leadership. The Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, has defended plans to give workers the right to switch off outside of working hours. Labour wants to restrict employers from contacting staff by phone or by email, saying workers should be able to disconnect from devices in their downtime. A similar legislation is already in place in France. Liverpool is being seen as the big winner after hosting the Eurovision Song Contest, with the Prime Minister saying the city has done the UK and Ukraine proud. Swedish pop star Lorraine made history, becoming the only woman to win the event twice. The UK's entry, May Muller, finished second last behind Germany. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere because Emily, she'll be back in a moment.
I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 8 p.m. on G Welcome back to GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver, on your TV, online and digital radio. Now, you've been getting in touch on our big topic of the day, net migration. Calvin says, the British government have to leave the ECHR if we are to have any hope of solving this crisis. This gutless government need to do this now. Doesn't look very unlike... It doesn't look very likely, though. Uh, Chris says, one million in net migration. No one should vote Tory ever again. Damning stuff. And Sarah says, Australia have a points-based system that works. Students bringing over family members should be banned, as should anyone who hasn't paid into the system. And Pauline has to say, these people come to the UK because they can have an easy life funded by the British taxpayer without having to contribute anything themselves. The deal is that that good, they're prepared to risk their lives crossing the channel in order to hit the jackpot. Well, I do think the numbers of dependents for students and workers is absolutely out, out of control, considering, you know, our NHS is on its knees, our infrastructure is on its knees, we don't have enough homes. Where are these people even living? Uh, let me know your views, keep them coming in, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter as well, we're at GB News. Right. How is this for an example of the woke world we live in these days? Prison officers have been told to stop calling criminals convicts because it could be seen as offensive under new guidelines from civil servants. Yes, this is from civil servants. Prison staff have also been told to drop the term ex-con. They've been urged to use terms like, believe it or not, persons with lived experience or prison leavers <laughs> instead. Right, well, joining me now is former convict. Who better to talk to? Winston Davies in the studio with me now. So, Winston, your reaction to this story? Um, I think it's madness. Oh, well, there we go. <laughs> that's, that's that, then. No, no, it is, it is, because, look, um, 
you know, we're now sort of in a place where we can't call people by what they are. We can't say this, can't say that. Um, I went to a, a, a kids uh, football tournament yesterday mm -hmm. and took two of my boys and, and they won. They won every game. But they weren't allowed to be called winners. No. No, no, no winners. Just you participants. And this was run by the local football club? Yeah, all that sort of stuff, yeah. And there's no winners, right? So uh, Everyone off, gets a medal. This is literally, <laughs> literally that, right? So they, um, so they come off and they was like, oh, why, why, why didn't we win? I said, no, you did win. I said, you done the right things, you, you made the right choices and you won. I said, if you hadn't, you would have lost. And I said, like, you know, in life, if you make the wrong choices, you could lose your house, your business, your, your, your wife, your marriage. And I said, like, that's a reality of life. You know, you make the wrong choices and then there's consequences to it. For me, I made the wrong choices. I got caught with a car full of cannabis and I got sent to prison, rightly. I lost. I become a convict. Um, when I hear the word convict, even now, or ex-convict, there's a tension in me, there's a, there's a feeling of discomfort. But I used that when I was there and said, you know what, I don't want to feel like this, I don't want to be this. So I got trained I got in a trade, um, I come out, worked really hard, uh, built several businesses since then, I've employed hundreds of people, I've contributed millions to the, to the economy, and I've turned it around. And it's like, do you know what? Because I was called a convict, because now an ex-convict, when I hear that, that just drives me on to want to do more. So well, you're the, you're the model story, <laughs> aren't you, really? This is what we want as a society. We want people who are court-breaking the law to serve their time and come out, reform citizen, work on their life. You've started a business, you're doing charity work, of course, you're coming onto the TV now to share your experience. Do you think if everything had been sugar-coated for you mm. when in prison, mm. do you think that perhaps you wouldn't have had this success? Do you think sugar-coating with the terms like person with lived experience and yeah. removing that sort of... Because presumably this is to remove the stigma. But should we be removing the stigma? No, I don't think so. I think there should be a stigma to it. For, for, like I said, it, because it depends what you do with it. Mm. You know, do you use it to drive you on? Or do you say, oh, well, that's it, I'm going to give up and I'm just going to, you know, continue taking drugs or whatever else I'm going to do for the rest of my life? And the reality is, for me, the experience that I've learned over the last 15, this is 15, 20 years ago now, the experience I've learned of turning it around over time is actually people care more about my actions and the man I am today than what I did 15, 20 years mm. ago. People judge me on the content of my character rather than some label that someone wants to give me. So it's like, you know, the money, time and effort that they're spending trying to talk about this is madness. Talk about rehabilitation, talk about education, talk about training, getting people back into work. Three quarters of people that leave prison now, they don't have any employment, they don't have any idea about what they're going to do. They've spent three, four, five years sitting in their cell, not doing that much or just about ticking boxes, and then we're expecting them to come out and get a job and, and turn it around. Why is re a re-offending rate so high? Well, that's, well that's, a, that's a very good point. You make a number of good points there. Civil servants work to come up with policies mm. to make our public services better, to make our country better. Mm. Why on earth are they focused on language when, as you say, there are so many issues in our prison system? Because... They're not persons with lived experience. <laughs> well, clearly not. Right. The, the people who are, you know, like writing essays about how we need to treat prisoners more nicely and things, and actually... Uh, <laughs> no, Emily, no, no, one, no one's um, contacted me, emailed me, called me and said to me, what do you think? You've gone through that system, you've turned it around, you've made changes and you're doing well, you're contributing mm. back to this uh, society. What do you think? People aren't doing that. They, they Has said, no one done that? No one's done that, no. And, and, I, and I've been, the thing is, like, you know, even doing things like this, it's a bit of a risk. You know, I've got my, my businesses, I've got people that don't necessarily know my story, but I'm like, it's worth that risk because of the importance of what I've got to say. Yeah, may I ask your view on, because another story that comes up is um, about ex-cons, mm -hmm. <laughs> former prisoners, mm -hmm. criminals, former criminals, mm -hmm. being um, given jobs. Now, a lot mm -hmm. of businesses are wary to hire yep. people who've been in prison mm -hmm. for time. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Because I know there are businesses up and down the country mm -hmm. that do this on purpose. They purposefully um, hire people with that background. 100%. Look, I think it's a case-by-case -case, uh, mm -hmm. basis. You know, if someone's in for 
serious, serious violence, murder, serious sexual offences. You know, there's there's a, there's a difference, but the, the, actually the majority of prisoners are actually short-term prisoners serving like 18 months or less. So for those people, there's got to be an opportunity for them to turn it around. So back in probably 2014, I was running a um, new build construction site, and we were actually taking serving prisoners out of prisoners prison and giving them opportunities to come and work during the day. I found that those guys, because they had so much to lose, like if they didn't get it right, they're going back into closed conditions, they worked really hard. And actually by giving them an opportunity, obviously it's like, again, case by case, you've got to speak to these people, understand what, where their head's at. But by giving opportunity, these guys have worked hard and out of about four or five of them, None of them have reoffended since. Some have gone on to, you know, do management jobs. Because they've got something to lose. They've got, they've yeah, got exactly. a stake. Hundred percent. Yeah. If you've got, if you haven't got anything to lose, hundred percent. Then, then you may as well continue with crime, giving people an opportunity and a chance to to get on and you know build a new life. That's what we want. But we don't want to go too softly, softly with the language. It's just completely pointless. Thank you very much, Indy. Lovely. Thank Winston you, Winston Davies. Thank you Cheers. for joining me to talk about that rather bizarre story from the civil service calling ex-cons people with lived experience to to. Uh, to not offend them. Anyway, moving on. Labour are planning to make working from home a legal right. That's according to a leaked 86-page policy handbook, which has been circulated ahead of Labour's National Policy Forum. Labour's policy plans have been making waves this weekend after Keir Starmer claimed his government would be new Labour on steroid steroids. Here's what Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds said when he was asked about the working from home plans. This is a response we've seen in, in lots of countries to how technology has changed the way we work. I mean, France, Italy, uh, Belgium, Spain have laws that are all in this area. As I say, this is not a definitive statement of party policy, but again, it's things that we are looking at that we will consider to make sure the balance uh, is right. And I think everybody recognises that there has to be a balance between working life, family life, the other things that are important. The best employers already recognise that and will look at the best approach to make sure that is the case. So it's an important area to consider, but this is not a statement of manifesto. This is a leak from the, the deliberations that we will have that will ultimately get to that manifesto where we'll decide the right way forward. So, I want to know what you think. Is a push to make flexible working a legal right really a big, bold Blairite, Blairite policy? Or is it to appeal to the, to the lazy among us? Let's see what Peter Edwards thinks. He's the former editor of the Labour List. Peter, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Do you think the government, well, a government in waiting, should really be announcing such a policy? Is it for the government to decide how employers choose to build their contracts with their employees? Well, in the run-up to the general election, any good opposition will set out what its policies are going to be. And as Johnny Reynolds said, the Shadow Cabinet Minister, this is under deliberation, but it may well end up in the manifesto. Why are Labour doing it? I think it's a really attempt to get on top of the massive changing trends in, in the labour market. So that's AI, that's gig economy, and of course, flexibility, as we've just been talking about. And, you know, when a Labour government works well, it's a partnership between business and unions and government. I think that's what they're trying to do again and move on from this era under Richie Sunak where you have a few giveaways of business and a few fallings out with business. And it's really stop start. They want to make it a partnership. Yeah, I get that, uh, Peter. But, you know, we've seen the idea that bosses shouldn't be allowed legally to contact their employees on WhatsApp, email and phone at the weekends or out of working hours. I mean, what planet are they living on? Anyone who wants to get ahead or has a good relationship with their boss is going to happily accept phone calls, emails, out of hours. Not everyone is clock in, clock out, that's me, gone. It's just unrealistic. We live in a very flexible world. Well, I think it's down to bosses to show common sense. But it's right, like in a lot of areas, to have protections as well, you know, because 30 or 40 years ago, one might have said, well, of course, um, women should be paid the same as men and we don't need to legislate that. But in fact, there was, there was a huge amount of inequality across the workforce. So I believe lots of these things should come down to common sense and decency. But clearly, you need a foundation underpinning that. But when there are a few bad bosses, uh, people in the labour market are protected. And I think... The idea that you can be contacted seven days a week by your employer is not really fair. Think about people mm. with caring responsibilities at either end of the age spectrum. It's right to build in the odd safeguards. It's just about managing the relationship with your employer.
I'm not sure, Peter. I'm not sure we need the law involved in this much intricacy myself. Um, it just seems to be a job creation scheme for lawyers, in my view. That's what I can see down the road. But thank you very much indeed. Peter Edwards, former editor of The Labour List, giving his thoughts on Labour's new working from home as a legal right. Do you agree with that? You've been getting in touch on our big topic of the day, Labour's plans to make... Oh, on this very thing. Sandra says, if the Labour Party wins a general election and it becomes law that workers have the right to work from home, Will there soon be a two-tier employment system with employers offering a better wage to those who will come into work? Well, presumably, then the Labour Party would make that illegal um, or some such thing. But yes, it doesn't exactly appeal to the very many people who can't work from home by virtue of their work being out and about. Anyway, Eileen says, obviously you don't get 100% output from people working from home as you would be in the office. It is also very isolating and destructive for productivity. Yes, we talk about loneliness all the time and one thing that really can raise the spirits, not for everyone of course, is to go into the office and have a few conversations with real live people rather than over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. It really is quite miserable. I was sick of it by the end of lockdown. Michael says, actually I was more productive working from home than in the office. No interruptions, fewer stupid meetings and no office politics. Only one tea break in the morning as opposed to three in the office. Well, there you go. Michael loves working from home. I personally think it's a little bit miserable not to ever want to see your colleagues in real life, but hey-ho, people have different lives. Keep your views coming in. And while you're at it, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GB News. So moving on to another big story that's affecting a lot, a lot of young people. Many universities across the country are drawing up plans to cope with striking staff who are refusing to grade and mark exams. Some students could be forced to postpone their graduations as the industrial dispute over pay and working conditions continues. So joining me to discuss this is political and social commentator Lynn May. Lynn. You're not too long out of university, are you? No, I actually graduated from my second degree during a lockdown. Right. I had to have uh, my graduation postponed. So for many of us, we've already had a kicking in the teeth with COVID. We've, I had to do my exams actually at home and the pressure of that was phenomenal. So instead of, uh, you know, massively criticising lecturers, I'm really disappointed in them because lecturers are well paid when you look at the average of payment in terms of in the UK. Uh, a starting lecturer starts often at 40,000 and can go all the way up to PhD 90,000 pounds. And if you look at how much students... And you can write books paying, and do all exactly. sorts as well. Yes. There's so many, there's so many lecturers. When I was at university, that wasn't their sole job. Mm. They would give, you know, talks and speeches at various other events. And I just think we want to encourage students to try and work as hard as possible through the hard times. You have people, you know, when you're a student you're living on beans on toast oftentimes so what a horrible message this is conveying to young people to say you know we're going to start complaining especially when we can see inflation is due to come down so i don't understand what it is they actually want well having listened to a couple of professors talking about this and those who support the strike action they say it's all about the staff who aren't on proper contracts. So there are some staff that come in and they're paid 30, 50 pounds an hour to deliver a lecture or something like that. Um, and they say it's not enough to cover the costs of getting there, etc., etc. But I would argue no one's forcing you to take on that kind of a contract, right? You could uh, look for a full time position if that's what you preferred. Holding students to ransom, not marking their essays. There are there are students who apparently have written their dissertations, 15,000 words, even more, and they might not even get them marked and they may not even contribute to their final grade. The injustice of that exactly. when you're paying, what, no, 12 grand, uh, nine grand a year? Nine grand a year. And we're talking about people that are the most educated, the most educated in society who have loads of skills in terms of public speaking. They can do a maraud of things, like you said, write books, write articles. And for them to have to put students in this predicament, I think is really, really upsetting. Do you think there are a lot of professors who are actually, uh, well, 
they prefer to, they're, they're, they're political activists. Yes. Because um, if, if social media is something to go by, some of the most prolific tweeters out there mm -hmm. and uh, rally organisers and people on the media are all professors at XYZ University. Well, we know that they're very politically imbalanced. I remember when we were having an open discussion in my public law lecture and I said, well, you know, I'm considering voting for Brexit and I was told that my views were disgusting. So there was no balance. Me. No, there was no balance there. But I'm, I'm not surprised at this. I think now we're seeing everyone jump on the bandwagon of striking and I work in housing. I could easily strike, but I know what that will do to my um, social tenants if I start striking and all of us as people in housing. But what you do is you get creative. You look for other bits of work to do or you just hold tight. Us as a country need to really hold tight through this cost of living crisis. Inflation is due to come down. And my question to lecturers would be, when it does come down, are you willing to then take a pay cut? Well, I don't think they are going to be. But oh, and just a broader question about the state of our university system. I am always amazed that not m that we still continue to have as many people as we do going to university. Because if you look at the costs, it's becoming more and more clear that it is an absolutely well. It's a tax for life now. Yeah, and and people, do you think young people are starting to look differently at the options? Oh, 100%. I would encourage anyone who wants to go to university, you really have to have a plan. Mm. I remember years ago, you'd go to university because it's something that your friends would do. You, you want to have a bit of a jolly as well as maybe come out of a degree. But I would really have a look at what you're going to do with that degree. And if it's going to be the only way that you can, let's say, be a doctor. And even now, they're looking at different ways of it's becoming interesting, a doctor. Yes. Yeah, or a lawyer. Or, but these sorts of degrees, like, you know, me, media and marketing and, you know, the arts. You don't need to go to university and it's a huge cost. Uh, but I would say this, university is still a positive thing to think about because it does put you around people that you might not ever meet yeah. in your everyday life. From all life. over the country. Exactly. So and I the world. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be negative uh, about university. Like I said, I've been twice and I'm going to go again end of the year. <laughs> so, yeah. You're a serial <laughs> university student. So I wouldn't knock it, but I would really look at if there's other avenues such as apprenticeship, that can get you to where you need to go. Yes, I mean, for example, media. A lot of people study in media studies and they never get a sniff of actually working in the actual exactly, media, really. Exactly. So there are lots of different options for how to get into the job that you want to do, thank thankfully. Thank you very much, Lynn May, political no commentator there and also works in housing, by the sounds of things, and recent students. So this is GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver. We've got plenty more still to come. Keir Starmer plans to give EU nationals the vote, and also 16 and 17 year olds. What does this reveal about his ambitions to reverse Brexit, perhaps? Also, as NHS waiting lists hit new records, what does the backlog tell us about the state of our healthcare system? Well, not good news, it seems, and the fallout continues after Rishi Sunak's U turn on the bonfire of EU laws. Were Remainer civil servants to blame? We've got all of that coming up in the next hour, so don't go anywhere. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you or know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I'm a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we 
get out of it. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale right. completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello, welcome to GB News Sunday. I'm Emily Carver. For the next hour, I'll be keeping you company on your TV, online and digital radio. So coming up on the show this hour, we were promised a grand ceremonial bonfire of EU legislation, but that seems to have been pitifully extinguished. What will the U-turn mean for the government and the country? Our Labour election rigging. Keir Starmer's under fire for reportedly planning to give the vote to 16 and 17 year olds and EU nationals. Plus, NHS waiting lists hit new records in England. What does this tell us about the state of our healthcare system? We've got more on all of that after the news headlines with Rory. Thank you very much, Emily. The latest from the GB Newsroom. Nurses are calling for a double-digit pay offer to prevent further strike action. The head of the Royal College of Nursing, Pat Cullen, told the Sunday Times the government risks another six months of industrial action if negotiations aren't reopened. Members rejected a 5% offer, which was accepted by 14 other unions. A new ballot for strikes will be held later this month. Well, residents in North Devon told us they need to consider the current economic climate. I do believe they are worth every penny of 5%. But um, whether they're worth more, I think probably yes. Well, we definitely need them, and we need the health service. It's being run down by this government, which can't blame them for COVID because it's a new disease, but the rest of it, they mucked up. I think they should accept the offer that's on the table because we're all suffering from the cost of living crisis. And as a pensioner, although we've had a big rise this time, it's probably not going to last, and we're affected by everything as well. Suggestions of unrest within the Conservative Party are being downplayed after the Prime Minister was blamed for the recent local election results. Rishi Sunak is facing criticism after nearly 1,000 councillors were lost and the decision to scale back post-Brexit plans to scrap EU laws. Well, former Home Secretary Priti Patel accused the leader of failing to listen to his own party, adding the Tories hadn't covered itself in glory since Boris Johnson's leadership. Energy Secretary Grant Chaps says the PM is doing the right things and people just need to be patient. I think this, and she was referring to the set of elections, 
um, which were obviously very uh, difficult for the Conservatives. There weren't a good set of elections for us. Um, but this is the first opportunity people have had to comment on all the shenanigans of last um, summer and those le many leadership changes that went on. I think people were venting their frustration. I actually think that Rishi Sunak, in his five-point plan to halve inflation and grow the economy and reduce uh, our debt and cut the NHS waiting list and stop the small boats, I think he's doing exactly the right things. And let's judge him against that. Let's judge this government against that when it comes to the next election. The Shadow Business Secretary has defended plans to give workers the right to switch off outside of working hours. Labour wants to restrict employers from contacting staff by phone or by email, saying workers should be able to disconnect from devices in their downtime. The similar legislation is already in place in France. Jonathan Reynolds told us it will promote productivity. I think we do want to see uh, the kind of employment laws that will protect family life, give people some time uh, in order to do the other things that are important in life as well as work. I think that's been eroded very significantly in recent years. I think uh, the labour market itself means that more people want flexibility in the workplace, but I'm absolutely confident in the, the aggregate platform we'll put forward is the one that will give people hope and optimism and turn this country around after 13 years of Conservative government. Meanwhile, the party says it has plans to create 80,000 new jobs in the car industry. Labour says it will part finance eight factories to achieve its goal. It will also help power nearly two million electric vehicles. It says the proposal will see the West Midlands benefit from 28,000 jobs and 11,000 roads will be created in the North West. Turkey is bracing itself for possible protests as a result of the presidential election. Voters are deciding whether or not President Erdogan, who's been in power for 20 years, should be re-elected. Opinion polls ahead of the ballot give his main rival, Kemal Kilic Daru, a slight lead. A clear indication of the first round result is expected this evening. Russian missiles have hit the city of Ternopil, home to this year's Ukrainian Eurovision entry. They were fired as the pop group Torvoshi performed in Liverpool, with the state emergency service posting a video of a warehouse that was hit. Meanwhile, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has secured more military aid from Germany, thanking Chancellor Olaf Scholz and his government for their solidarity. Well, back home, the Prime Minister praised Liverpool after hosting the song contest, saying the city has done Ukraine and the UK proud. Swedish pop star Lorraine made history, becoming the only woman to win the event twice. The country now ties with Ireland for the most Eurovision victories, both claiming seven titles. The UK's entry, May Muller, finished second last behind Germany. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now, though, back to Emily. Thank you, Rory. So let's get stuck in to the political news this afternoon. Keir Starmer, he's been accused of wanting to rig future general elections by changing who's allowed to vote. Leaked policy plans reveal Labour is considering giving the vote to EU nationals as well as 16 and 17 year olds. This has, of course, sparked accusations that Starmer is, in fact, trying to rig the outcome of future elections and that the move could also be a new bid to roll back Brexit. Let's get the view of Tom Harwood, our deputy political Editor, is it me being cynical to think this might be a bit of a ploy to make sure Labour stay in government? Well, certainly eyebrows are being raised because, of course, the normal situation by which democracies function around the world is that citizens of the country uh, that is doing the voting decide who is the government and people who are not citizens do not get that right. However, things have been muddled in the United Kingdom uh, recently, particularly amongst devolved administrations. For some years now, in the uh, Scottish parliamentary elections and, indeed, Welsh parliamentary elections, those devolved elections, uh, EU citizens who have settled status can vote. Mm. Uh, and now, that's not the case for general elections, but according to this leaked policy document from within Labour, they would like that right to be extended to the around 3.4 million EU citizens in the UK with settled status, but for whatever reason have chosen not to become British citizens. They would want those people to vote as well. And children 
as well by the looks of things. Yes, 16 <laughs> and 17 year olds to be precise. Now 16 and 17 year olds have been voting for the last couple of years in Wales in Welsh parliamentary and council elections and since 2016 in Scottish parliamentary and council elections and the Labour Party has been pretty vocal on its policy to lower the franchise for people across the United Kingdom. It's a curious age 16 <laughs> because it's not an adult. You're quite right in saying that a 16-year-old is a child. In fact, there are all sorts of international protections for 16 and 17-year-olds under the United, uh, under the, the UN Convention on, on the Rights of the Child. Um, so it's very odd to then see that sort of responsibility lowered when in so many other areas in recent years, we're actually seeing responsibility ages rise. So you can no longer leave school at 16 in the way that you used to be able to in this country. You have to stay in uh, training or education until 18. Similarly, you can't now get married independently in the way that you used to at the age of 16. Uh, the way that you can join the army has changed profoundly. And also, more than that, if we're looking at some of the ideas that we've seen uh, proposed, particularly by left-wing parties, about raising the smoking age, uh, perhaps into the mid-20s or even the mid-30s, about uh, changing the way people can achieve a driving licence so that they can't drive any I... of their friends until the age of 25. It seems everything's moving in the other direction mm. apart from the voting age, which does raise an eyebrow. Are you saying that our politicians might be uh, picking and choosing when you become an adult based on what's, uh, well, what's uh, beneficial? Well, it does seem a remarkable inconsistency. Yes. You'd think that you'd want to be relatively consistent with what's known as the age of majority, the age at which you get rights, but also you have responsibilities where you're, no, where you're liable for your own actions. And it seems that we're muddling that even further. Also, I would say it does, it. Yeah, it does seem that in, our, in society people are children for, for longer than in the past. We're doing things a little bit later, possibly because of university, etc., housing costs, and so on. Now, we didn't touch on this last hour, but the RCN, the Royal College of Nursing, they are demanding a double-digit pay rise now. Yes, I think they're rather put out that the vote in the uh, council, in the NHS council, went against the membership of the RCN because, let's not forget, there are lots of different unions within the NHS and the vast majority of those who voted in the ballots actually backed the pay deal for 5% and a backdated mm. lump sum for last year as well. A fairly generous by the standards, certainly, of the private sector uh, offer. Um, and it does seem that the RCN are now looking to do other things because they will be getting that pay rise now but they're a little bit put out that their more militant stride was not uh, taken on by their comrades in other parts of the NHS so we are seeing um, some noises bubble up now about potentially more action coming later in the year. I mean come the next election if there is still strike action ongoing within the NHS I think it's going to be even more difficult for uh, Rishi Sunak, but we shall see. Thank you very much indeed. Our deputy political editor there, Tom Harwood, bringing us up to date on what's going on in Westminster. So, moving on, we were promised, weren't we, a bonfire of EU laws, but that seems to have been extinguished somewhat. Business Secretary Kemi Badenoch, she said it's impossible for the government to push through plans to ditch all EU laws because of the Whitehall blob. Instead, only 600 out of 4,800 EU laws will face scrapping or reform. So, joining me in the studio, very quick changeover, Chair of the British Political Action Conference, Henry Bolton, and former Minister for Europe, Dennis McShane. I think I've had you both on together before, actually. You have. So we'll yeah. see if sparks Great fly. Um, who shall I start with on this? Uh, let's go to Henry. Henry, Hi. do you feel like this is all a bit of a, a betrayal? of Brexit? Um, partly. Partly. And, you know, none of these things are, are, are black and white, sadly. Um, It'd be so much easier. Yeah, it would. It, would, <laughs> it really would. Uh, but the government seems to treat them as though they're black and white. And uh, so do the media. And not yourself, of course. <laughs> um, what we've got is we've got a whole, a whole bunch of legislation there that the government said, right, we've got to, we want to get rid of this. And everybody said, good, that's mm. progress. All the Brexiteer side said, great, that's good progress. You know, we're finally doing something. Let's get rid of these laws that tie us to the European Union and, and whatever. 
And, and in fact, some of those laws do it. So, for example, right at the top of the list, there is, a, well, it's not a law, it's a regulation. So this is something that the Commission basically has, has imposed, and it is imposed on member states on, in terms of, and it, it governs or lays, establishes the controls and inspections to, to enforce the common fisheries policy. So that's one that, for example, should go because ministers in the UK cannot make decisions to do something slightly different, to diverge from the EU in that respect, whilst that's still on, on the statute books. So let's get rid of that. It has the power of law, it's enforceable, State, member states have to comply with it. It's still sitting there. So that, those sort of things need to change. But on the other hand, there are also regulations in there that prevent the import and export of dog and cat fur. Now, how many people in this country would really like to see the UK importing and exporting dog or cat fur? Probably very, very few. So that regulation actually has some, some merit. Um, but that's in there to be removed as well without any particular replacement. And if you look de at in a detailed way at UK law, the parliament has, or gov the government has introduced a law that um, now gives the Secretary of State uh, the power, using a statutory instrument, to bypass that and to allow the import and export, import and export of dog fur. Do we want that? So I, 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 I don't think this has been thought through by the government fully. And the, res the result is they have presented this as 4,000 pieces of EU legislation mm -hmm. that must go to break away from the European Union um, and have suddenly found that actually some of it is actually quite useful and some of it they don't really know what the consequences are. They haven't thought it through. My, my final point on that, just very quickly, is that this signifies the real betrayal of Brexit, which is that the government, in fact, no politician in this country, has presented a clear vision and a clear roadmap as to how we achieve that vision post-Brexit. Mm. What do we want to be? What do we want to do with agriculture, fisheries, defence, security, immigration, borders, trade? This never happened. It still never happened. And therefore, how do you draw up a really relevant list of EU legislation that you want to get rid of. Mm. Um, that, that that's there it... presents you from developing new policy. So there's a whole load of things to unpack on this. It's a failure of government and failure of public administration and a failure, which I've always said, there's nothing new in what I'm saying here, of Brexiteers, leading Brexiteers, elected and otherwise, to lay down a clear vision and say that's where we want to go. That still needs to be done. Well, there you go. I mean, it's very difficult for um, the Conservative government under its new leadership to do so, knowing that a general election is coming very soon and with popularity pretty low too to set out a whole new vision. But I, I take your point that they, they haven't done so yet. Dennis, what do you think? A lot of Brexiteers thought that one of the first things the government would do would be to go through all of these EU laws and regulations with a fine tooth comb, decide which ones benefit our economy, benefit mm -hmm. our citizens, which ones don't, which ones can be amended a little bit. It's not beyond the wit of man, is it? Are the civil servants at fault here? Good Lord, no. I mean, if, if I'm in complete agreement with Henry. I, thank goodness he's come over to my side of the fence. He's just made the speech. <laughs> I have moved. I made... <laughs> Hang on, we both you so that you'd 20, be different. 2014, 2015, 2016, it's a bit more complicated. It's not like Boris Johnson just dumping one of his wives or women. It's technically unbelievably You've got the Boris Johnson siren there. Uh, and so... What well, it's not particularly the famous the blob. Well, the blob then is Joanna Lumley. I don't know if she's an honorary blob. She is leading the campaign on animal welfare because she believes it's important. And what Jacob Rees Mogg wanted to do was rip up all the laws on the British statute book that we fought to get on onto the European statute book on animal welfare. Henry mm. correctly mentioned fish. Well, we could rip all that up, then we wouldn't because export a single let sardine me just, to let Europe. Let me just interject there, because I don't know if you've seen recently, but there's oh. been news stories about how the UK has chosen to align ourselves with the EU laws mm -hmm. on animal testing. So we are yeah. now animal testing to be aligned with the EU. What is all that about? Well, well again, you know, if it's back to my, my main point there, which was if you don't have a clear policy as to, a policy as to what you want to do... Now, 
and policy and its implementation is what the public will vote on. What is it you want to do, political party? What is it you are capable of delivering? What have you failed to deliver that you said you would? All of that sort of thing. That's what people vote on. If you, have got, if you haven't got clear policy, a clear plan, a clear vision, which is about leadership, then you cannot possibly work out what legislation you need in place. If you want to ban dog and cat imports, if that's important, uh, fur imports, then you've got to have the legislation in, in place. It's, it's simple. But we're starting in the wrong place. We're, we're starting from, I think, a position of we have to break clean of the European Union. We don't really know how to do it. We don't know how to present it to the public. So we're going to take all this retained legislation and we're going to put the axe to it. And people will like that. Mm. And that's true, people will like it, but most people listening and watching here have not got the time to look through even the list, let alone scrutinise well, each piece of the 4,000 well, pieces of legislation. Actually, 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 we do have an absolutely enormous civil service. Huge. Oh, the civil service. Can't yeah. be beyond the wit to look through some of these laws. Some of them are pretty basic, aren't they? They're not but, all uber, uber complex. But, the, but, but you, can't, you can't know whether you want it or not unless you know what policy you want. When I was helping but governments in Central putting Asia... Every, putting I, every law and regulation to a parliamentary debate... No, you don't need to oh do that. Oh, my goodness. But you don't need to do that, but you do need to know what policy you're aligning mm -hmm. the legislation to. When I was in Central Asia, they said, well, you know, we want to do this, this, this and this, but the law doesn't allow us to do it. And I said, well, you know, where law is made by your assembly, OK? If, you're, if you've got a government that wants to pursue a particular policy, you then look, does the legislation allow us to do it, yes or no? If it doesn't, well, what do we need mm. to enable us to do it? You don't start off with just a principle of let's axe the legislation. No, well, you are very much um, echoing a column that was in... Sorry to leave you. Henry's been dominating. Henry's been absolutely dominating. I don't have to say anything. Uh, no, he's speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> he, should well, have, he should have been Jacob Rees Mogg. Well, 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 this, this, is, but this isn't politics. This is common sense. Hang on, this Henry. Henry. Common we've, got to give, wow. we've got to give the last word to Dennis because I think it will have to be the last word. But what Henry said there has echoed actually what's been written in today's Daily Express, which of course is a Brexit backing newspaper. You've got Liam Fox. Fox, Brexiteer, David Davis, Brexiteer, Andrea Leadsom, Brexiteer, saying that Kemi Badenoch's right to uh, U-turn on this scrapping of all the Excellent. EU laws, etc. So Let's it, have lots more. But I think the worry, though, Dennis, from people Brexiteers, from the average, the average Joe Brexiteer, is that if they don't do this now, yep. it's not going to happen because we, we're Correct. probably going to have a Labour government or possibly a Labour, Liberal, Democrat, SNP coalition of sorts. Doubt it, but... It's never going to happen. Look... But you'd be happy, a, though, Dennis. It's, I'm not happy. How can I be happier? We've had seven of the worst economic and social divisive years of our life. Our politics the last seven years in all parties, I stress that, has been dreadful. You won't find a symbol, single manager in the chemical industry who thinks it's a good idea to take working chemical regulations that allow us to export to Europe and tear them all up to please Jacob Rees-Mogg. Dennis Bob. is right. It's every political party... Thank you. My goodness, it's a, it's a, it's a total lack of leadership across the board. Lack yeah. of vision. And until we have that, and this is why I, I welcome the CDO conference that's taken place, not because of political bias or anything, but, but simply because there is a, at least some growing awareness in one of the political parties that you need some visionary leadership and you need capable people to in Parliament. From Priti Patel? Well, I, 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 there's, capable some, leadership. there's a growing awareness <laughs> that that's a need. Come on, Eddie. We, we, there Look is at you do scoffing. It. Look at the Labour front bit. No, you've got I to think Henry should be Prime Minister. <laughs> and I'd work for him. If he was Prime Minister, Who, me? Sure. Do you know yes. what, though, Dennis? Dennis, Dennis it's, very, it's very Dennis. easy to, you know, <laughs> sit at the sidelines and say, oh, they're an idiot, they're an idiot, they're an idiot. But I think it's a very difficult time to be it in is. politics. And uh, looking at the shadow front bench, I'm not too uh, impressed with that. I'm not sure our viewers at home would be either. It's a, it's a bit of a Hobbes choice, really. We have to break clean the European it's, Union. It's, it's, we have to break it's, it's difficult. I agree. The quality of politicians generally... Sorry, that's, that's, that's Maybe we need to pay stuff. them a million pounds a year and then maybe they'd be half decent. Possibly no, no. not, I mean, then they'd Boris, just be I'll, 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 I'll do it for 20 year. grand, but I'll only there do two hours a week. There you go. <laughs> Henry Bolton, who is chair of the British Political Action Conference, and Dennis McShane, former minister for Europe. We had a bit of agreement, but we also had a bit of disagreement, which is nice. You are watching and listening to GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver. Still ahead.
As waiting lists hit a new record of 7.3 million people, they were 7.2 million people, now it's 7.3 in England alone. Is the NHS fit for purpose? All of that after this. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Yes, welcome back. You're watching and listening to GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver, on your TV and radio. So you've been getting in touch on our big topic of the day, the government's U-turn on its proposed bonfire of EU laws. We were just debating that with Henry Bolton and Dennis McShane. Elizabeth says it was obvious this bill would go as soon as Boris was toppled. Sunak is all talk, no Delivery, yes, and as Henry says there, does he have a vision? John says, the biggest democratic vote this country has ever known decided not to stay in the EU and be governed by its laws. Deceitful politicians in Westminster have decided they are above the will of the British public. It does appear that way. Lucy says, I shall never regret voting for Brexit, but we have been disastrously let down by our politicians, especially Sunak, who is not our elected Prime Minister. He has reneged on promises to shred thousands of EU laws and protect our borders. Well, this does link to those crazy net migration figures that we may well be seeing come the end of the month for the past year. Um, people voted Brexit to control our borders, take back control, and it seems like our politicians have very much lost control. Anyway, Clive says the EU laws were determined by the EU members at the time, one of which was the UK. They are our laws. Well, there's the alternative view. We accepted them then. We should accept them now. We should keep them in our statute books. I think that we should look through all of them, decide which ones serve us, which ones don't, 
and go from there. But please do keep your views coming in. Subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're at it. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GB News. So, waiting lists. Back to waiting lists in the NHS. They have hit a new record high. 7.3 million people in England alone are now waiting for treatment. The Prime Minister, of course, has pledged to cut waiting lists, making it one of his five top priorities. When he unveiled the priorities in January, Rishi Sunak promised, in quotes, NHS waiting lists will fall and people will get the care they need more quickly. Well, it doesn't seem to be going awfully well. Joining me to discuss this is Lucy Johnston, who is the Health and Social Affairs Editor at the Sunday Express. Lucy. Hello, Lucy. Thank you for joining me. Now, let's try and be a little bit positive. Is any progress being made when it comes to these waiting lists? We've seen the big headline figure has gone up. But is there any anything good going on? Um, well, a small uh, positive note is that the waits for 1.5 years have gone down from about, I think, 30,000 to about 11,000 um, since Rishi Sunak said he would abolish them. So he hasn't got rid of those long waits. But that's just a small glimmer in this very hopeless situation. And the waits are not only affecting the quality of life of the patients, people who are disabled, in pain, or may, need, may not be able to see, need cataract operations. But it's the knock-on effect mm. of those people needing treatment. So it affects the economy. They can't work. They visit their GPs more often, looking for help or drugs. They may end up in A&E if something becomes... Uh, gallbladders, for example, can become infected. They then turn to... I mean, it's just, you know, it's a huge problem affecting the economy and affecting the rest of the healthcare service. And mm. uh, many have had to turn to private savings in order to pay for operations and may even be fleecing themselves, you know, of, of thousands of pounds that they may not have or borrowing yes, money. It, so it's a huge ripple effect. Yes, and, and Lucy, it seems to me that it's... <laughs> The way you, you receive NHS treatment differs greatly, where, depending on where you're situated. We've seen headlines this week. Ten, in, ten NHS trusts responsible for nearly half of UK's patient backlog. So it really is a bit of a postcode lottery when it comes to how quickly you're going to be seen and treated. Now, the Prime Minister, I'm sure you've reported on this, he's come out to say we're going to hand more work to pharmacists, um, to give GPs, um, well, to reduce their workload and so that people get seen more quickly. What's the response you've seen to that policy idea? Well, the pharmacists are keen to do more work and they want to be more involved in healthcare, but they claim they don't have the resources to do it. They say that they've got about a million, a billion pounds worth of debt uh, or a hole in their funding from government over the last 10 years and that the money that's going towards encouraging them or uh, bringing them into doing more treatments for patients is not nearly enough. It's about 624 million over the next two years. So they say they can't do it. They haven't got the resources to do it. And some doctors are very worried as well about pharmacists taking on decisions that yeah. they think need a lot of training. Um, some doctors are saying to me that it actually takes a lot of clinical skill to decide if someone needs antibiotics, for example. And if you get it wrong, obviously someone can die. And if you're over prescribing antibiotics, you end up risking an increase in multi-resistant or drug-resistant antibacterial act, bacterial infections, which can be deadly. So that's a difficult decision. But most of the work that the pharmacists are being asked to do probably doesn't involve many drugs or any oh. drugs. Most earaches, coughs, colds just get better on their own. So it's not going to take much of the work off the healthcare service, which really is dealing with, doctors are dealing with very complex cases, an aging population. And the problem is that we have reform after reform, and we have to somehow wrestle the political posturing out of the healthcare service. We have to look at how to look long-term instead of short-term fixes and headline-grabbing yeah. news. 
And really, it needs to, we need an IT system that works. We need weekend work would actually increase the throughput put that the doctors won't do, I mean, to Lucy, do that. And, and social care is, is I mean, immense. Lucy, I mean, a lot of us think there should be root and branch reform of the NHS. Instead, we have politicians tinkering around the edges for political reasons. We'll see what happens, but it's hardly surprising after lockdown that our waiting lists are so high. We see story after story of thousands of people not getting diagnoses, being left and now on waiting lists. It really is a terrible state of affairs. But thank you very much for bringing us up to date. Lucy Johnston there, Health and Social Affairs Editor at The Sunday Express. You are, of course, watching and listening to GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver. We've got lots more coming up on today's show. Labour wants to expand the franchise to EU nationals. Is Keir Starmer trying to rig voting to appear, appease his Remainer pals? But first, let's get the news with Rory. Thank you very much, Emily. The latest from the GB Newsroom. Nurses are calling for a double-digit pay offer to prevent further strike action. The head of the Royal College of Nursing, Pat Cullen, told the Sunday Times that the government risks another six months of industrial action if negotiations aren't reopened. Members rejected a 5% offer, which was accepted by 14 other unions. A new ballot for strikes will be held later this month. Suggestions of unrest within the Conservative Party are being downplayed after the Prime Minister was blamed for the recent local election results. Rishi Sunak is facing criticism after nearly 1,000 councillors were lost and the decision to scale back post-Brexit plans to scrap EU laws. Former Home Secretary Priti Patel accused the leader of failing to listen to his own party, adding the Tories hadn't covered itself in glory since Boris Johnson's leadership. The Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds has defended plans to give workers the right to switch off outside of working hours. Labour wants to restrict employers from contacting staff by phone or by email saying workers should be able to disconnect from devices in their downtime. Similar legislation is already in place in France. Merseyside Police has praised Eurovision fans for enjoying the event in Liverpool safely and responsibly. More than half a million people were in the city over the past nine days, making it the force's biggest policing operation to date. Swedish pop star Lorraine made history, becoming the only woman to win the event twice. And the UK's entry, May Muller, finished second last behind Germany. TV online, DAB Plus Radio and in TuneIn, this is GB News. Emily will be right back after this short break. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of 
light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, apparently. Do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. <laughs> We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver, on your TV and radio. So, Keir Starmer. He wants to give 3.4 million EU nationals currently in the UK the right to vote. That's according to the Sunday Telegraph, which reports Labour would expand voting rights to settled EU nationals who pay tax, as well as 16 and 17 year olds. But the proposals have drawn accusations of trying to rig the outcome of a future election and lay the groundwork for a future referendum to rejoin the EU. Quite a bit there to get through. Joining me is trade unionist and broadcaster Paul Embry and GB News presenter Albi Amancona. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Albi, I'll start with you. Let's, let's go with the EU nationals first. Should EU nationals be granted the right to vote because they pay tax here? I think there's a bit of nuance with this question of whether or not EU nationals should be allowed to vote in the United Kingdom general elections. Because if we look in different parts of the country, in Scotland and in Wales, they can vote in those Scottish and Welsh par Parliament elections. Also, EU nationals who are from countries that the UK have reciprocal agreements with, I think Spain, Luxembourg are two of those countries, can also vote in local elections. So I suppose the question would be, if some EU nationals can vote in some elections, why can't they vote in all elections? I would probably be cautious to change an electoral system which seems to work, but I do think there is a gen genuine question there mm. with if it's OK for some elections, why isn't it OK for all elections? But, Paul, have they got... Have they, just because devolved administrations have decided to allow votes to EU citizens doesn't make it right? No, and I don't think it is right. And I think the danger here is that it would be seen effectively as a form of gerrymandering. If the Labour Party mm. were to push ahead with it, people would conclude that, look, you didn't think necessarily you were going to win popular support on the basis of your ideas among the current electorate. Therefore, you're seeking to extend that electorate to people who you think broadly are going to be more sympathetic towards voting Labour. Um, and that's why any such proposal would be introduced. And you know, I think the ramifications of it are quite serious because I think, you know, the, the right to vote is a right which actually separates a an actual citizen from any other kind of resident. And, you know, in, a, in effect, the whole concept of citizenship, as we know, it would become meaningless mm -hmm. in that regard. Um, if the vote is is extended to uh, foreign nationals. And, you know, I think when you vote at a general election, more often than not, your vote is based on your own lived experience, to use that phrase. Often people uh, who have lived and worked here all their life and paid taxes here uh, all of their working lives and have a deep affinity with the country and make a decision at the ballot box on that basis rather than somebody, and I mean, dis mm. no, no disrespect to people like this, but people who may not have a particular affinity with Britain uh, and, and nationals of another country, don't necessarily have a British passport, um, and those two votes are weighted evenly, and that strikes me mm. as, as wrong, ultimately. That'll be surely, going back to basics, you should have to be British to vote in a British general election. Surely it should be as basic as that? 
Yeah, look, I think that is a reasonable point, but I also think it is equally reasonable for people to ask the question, if you're paying tax in this country, if you're contributing to British society, you can vote in some elections but not other elections, why can't you vote in all elections? And just to come back to I Paul's point... I paid tax point, in Hong Kong for a little bit, to, didn't mean I got a vote. Just to come back to Paul's point about gerrymandering elections, that some people on the, on the left might argue that the Tories in, introducing voter ID, even though it might not have worked very well in the local elections, was an attempt at gerrymandering elections. So this is something we see from all different kinds of political parties. It doesn't mean that there doesn't need to be a genuine mm. debate when these questions arise. Paul, do you, do you buy the, uh, the commentary around this, saying that this is a way for Keir Starmer to sort of move closer to the European Union because these citizens presumably would be in favour of rejoining? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what it is, Emily. And and I think also, actually, when you look at some of the other talk in the in the media about Labour also extending the vote to 16 and 17 year olds, um, I think that's probably being done for the same reason, because broadly that cohort of voters would be seen as more sympathetic to Labour. They would be seen as more EU friendly. Um, and I'm a great believer, look, don't try to fix the electoral system just because you can't win at that moment in time popular support for your ideas. You know, you've got to go out and argue harder and you've got to go out and convince people why you are right. You shouldn't try um, to manipulate the electoral system uh, and get over the line in that way. And I think that's exactly how people would, would see it. And I, I think with the 16 and 17 year olds, for example, I think it infantilizes our politics and it speaks to this idea that young people, and of course we should listen to young people, but somehow they're imbued with some sort of unique wisdom and old people are just kind of gammon and racist and their views should be dismissed. The danger for Labour is they need to win the hearts and minds of people in the Red Wall, people who have been dismissed as gammon over the last few years. And if they're seen to be gerrymandering the system in order to cancel out the vote of those voters, mm. um, then people will think, actually, you're just still treating us with contempt. You're still treating us with disrespect. You're still not our party. Why should we vote for you? That's the electoral pitfall for Labour. Yes, I think so. Albies, children, votes for children. Look, I think it's probably an interesting attempt to try and get young people more engaged with politics. I just wonder whether or not in the early 20th century, when the right to vote was extended to women and to people that didn't own property, people were having the same debates about political parties trying to gerrymander so they could win elections based on those, no, based on those people being we... able to vote. I just wonder if people were having similar debates then. <laughs> but actually, I think rather than do these throwing around these accusations that people are trying to rig the system, why don't we actually try and engage with just taking the issue at face value? What would votes at 16 mean? Now, I happen to believe that actually we're adults at 18 in this country and that's when we get the right to vote. But it's perfectly reasonable for people who disagree with me to have a point that they think votes at 16 and 17 are valid as they are in Scotland. But I think you're taking it too much at face value. This is a clear attempt to make sure that there is always a left-wing government in Government. But can young um, people not be right wing? Well, we're we're young, young, we're we know, right wing. We know there are very, very few Conservatives at that age. But, um, just look at the, the, the polling on various things. But do you not think that perhaps if votes were at 16 and 17, it would encourage the Conservative Party and the centre right of British politics to engage with young people more and actually solve issues that matter to young people? like housing that we often speak about on this channel. Well, I don't think kids at 16 and 17 are necessarily worrying about where they're going to live once they've, uh, you know, become an adult. It's, it's quite interesting, Paul, isn't it? Because the Labour Party are presumably saying that EU citizens should be able to vote because they're paying tax here. Well, no 16 and 17-year-olds are paying tax, are they? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think in some cases, children, so for example, child actors, if they earn beyond a certain amount, may well actually be liable to pay some degree of taxation. Well, that's a tiny so the amount. Logic well, yeah, absolutely, but I think it's the it's the principle here. So, so those people who argue no taxation without representation, they could effectively be arguing for, you know, a six, six, seven, eight, nine year old child actor to to have the vote. And so, so I know it was a demand of revolutionaries throughout history, but um, I think there are some real dangers of taking that to a, you know a literal degree, no taxation without representation. And the interesting thing, by the way, about votes at sixteen and seventeen, normally it's the masses who are demanding an extension of the vote and the elites who are usually trying to resist it. With votes at 16, 17, it's actually an inversion of that. It's the other way around. It's, it tends to be the, the elites and broadly the liberal elites who are demanding votes for 16 and 17-year-olds. And most of the people uh, out there kind of think, well, 
well, actually, I couldn't be trusted with the vote. So I couldn't be trusted with a kettle at 16 years of age, let alone the vote. So, you know, I think most people out there in the court of public public opinion raise their eyebrow and say, mm, no, not for 16 and 17 year olds. And, and think of their own kind of views and activities at that age and think I couldn't have been trusted with choosing a government. I was still getting detention at school. So the, the whole idea, I think, is a complete nonsense and should be rejected. I think so. That's all we've got time for on that one. But some food for thought there. Albie, I think you need to be far more cynical, in my view. <laughs> like Never. You. Thank you very much, Paul Embry there and Albie Awankona. Talking about Labour's plans to extend the vote further, 16 to 17 year olds perhaps, and EU nationals as well, who pay tax in this country. Is paying tax in this country enough to be granted the vote, or do you have to be British to vote in a British general election? I would argue the latter. Anyway, moving on. Tension is building as Chelsea prepare to face rivals Manchester United in the final of the Women's FA Cup final. Serial winners Chelsea are aiming to win the FA Cup for the third year in a row, while Manchester United are looking to end the Blues streak in their first women's final. For more, let's cross now to our reporter, Theo Chikomba, who is outside Wembley Stadium, where the match has just kicked off. It's just kicked off. It has, yes. It's been about 15 minutes into the game now and there was a goal disallowed within 20 seconds. Manchester United are getting the ball in the back of the net, but it was unfortunately disallowed. It's a tasty affair today between the two rivals. Manchester United currently sitting top of the Women's Super League with 50 points and Chelsea with 49. Although Chelsea do have a game in hand, if they do go ahead to win their game, they will be uh, top of the Super League again. But today, form goes out the window. How the team's been doing goes out the window it's all to play for here as 90,000 fans are here in the stadium fully packed out the atmosphere is going to be electric this afternoon and once the game is over the Prince of Wales will be handing over the trophy to the team which wins here today fans have traveled from all corners of the UK to come and see this game unfortunately just a few seconds ago uh, we did speak to one lady who unfortunately was sold a fake ticket so she hasn't been able to get in so she's had to unfortunately make her way home perhaps find a pub uh, to try and catch the match so that is unfortunate hope she's the only one because this is a big game it's the final everybody wants to see this interestingly though we've met some fans who are neutrals <coughs> They don't support neither team, but they've come here uh, just to support uh, women's football and how far it has come. Sold out last year, about half of the people attended the game, uh, but this time lots of people have come to see this game. So it's going to be a good one. So far, so good. It's nil-nil at the moment, uh, but plenty of time for either team to score and win the game. Good stuff. I will catch up on the result later in the day. It is nice to see a whole stadium packed full of supporters for women's football. It wasn't too popular only a couple of years ago, so it's good to see the progress for women. Um, I myself was no good at football at school, but I gave it a go. Anyway, moving on. The number of countries banning social media app TikTok from government phones is rising. Some in the UK now fear the platform could be in line for a general ban. Our reporter Tony Maguire spoke to one small business owner who says a potential ban could spell disaster for his business. Videos you love are just a search away, so get started. Just when everyone thought Facebook and Twitter had locked down the social media monopoly, along came TikTok. It's a social app, it's a video platform, it's a search engine, and an infinite scrolling endorphin factory for heightened user engagement. One billion active users are scrolling their way to consume 167 million TikTok videos in an internet minute. But why are governments so concerned? We are also going to ban the use of TikTok on government devices. We will do so with immediate effect. All four UK territories now ban TikTok from our government phones due to the national security threat of handing over device data to Chinese parent company ByteDance. But everyday users like Alex McHenry, whose company Kitchen Wrapper receives a staggering 75% of referrals from his TikTok followers, are concerned that a ban may soon reach public devices. There's levels to this, there's kitchen wraps and then there's kitchen wraps. 75% of your work is coming for TikTok. If we get a ban or the country decided we're just not going to, they can have TikTok anymore, that's going to be drastic for their business. Where are we getting our bookings for? We were dealing with going to pay dads, which is mere overheads, which would put our prices up, or we would just need to try and hope <laughs> that we can either get back on that platform or another platform picks up as quick as what we've done with this one. Alex lauds TikTok for being a vehicle for effective and free advertising. 
He says the appeal of his viral videos is significantly more effective for securing business than paid advertising. He isn't paying with money, but he is paying with his data, which has its own considerable value in the digital age. That's one reason Professor Azim Ibrahim, a Glaswegian research professor at the US Army War College, believes the risks associated with TikTok are at odds with British national security. The primary function of every government is to keep its people safe as national security considerations. And I understand from many people it's just a benign app, but the reality is their data is being amassed on a vast scale, unprecedented scale in human history. And that data will be used to manipulate public opinion as and when the Chinese Communist Party decides it's extremely dangerous and has to be looked at through the national security lens. That might be a hard pill to swallow for a billion active daily users. Unlike Facebook and Twitter, TikTok doesn't have a CEO with a public image problem, so despite long-standing security concerns, the unprecedented growth of TikTok shows no sign of slowing down. Tony Maguire, GB News. Well, there we go, Tony McGuire there on TikTok. I would miss TikTok if it was banned. I have spent many, many, many an hour actually scrolling through. Nana, what's coming up on the show? Oh, well, I mean, we've got so much going on. We're going to obviously kick things off with Sakir Starmer. Because obviously, I mean, to me, it looks like he's trying to socially engineer future wins forever for Labour by trying to bring yes. in 16 and 17 year olds to vote, which seems a bit much. So we're going to look at the migrant bonds as well, because there's a lot of complaining with regard to um, the RAF bases as well. Yeah. What are we going to do about this crisis? Then the disaster of the local elections, of course, for the Tory party. They lost, what, a thousand seats? They're it's... running out of time, aren't they, now, to turn it around? Mm. They are running out of time, mm. but there's still a little bit of time for them, we'll just see. Keir Starmer is certainly announcing things, or at least leaking things, having things leaked when it comes to policy. That is all from me today. Do stay tuned for Nana, who is coming up in just one moment. You've been watching and listening to GB News Sunday with me, Emily Carver. But first, let's take a look at the weather with Steve. Hello again, I'm Stephen Keats with your latest Met Office forecast. And we've got some patchy rain edging its way across parts of England and Wales this evening and tonight. A few showers elsewhere, but where skies are clearing across northern Britain and parts of Northern Ireland, well, it'll be turning quite chilly. That's behind this cold front in a colder air mass. This front then slowly shuffling its way further for southeast as the night, evening and night goes on, not making it to the far southeast until later on. So a three-way split then to start our Sunday evening. Clear spells and a few showers across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. This front slowly working its way further southeast across England and Wales. The odd heavier burst of rain possible across parts of eastern England for a time into the early part of Monday. Damp ends of the night in southeast England. Elsewhere though, clearing skies and where we've got those clear skies, it's going to be a chilly old night actually. Temperatures close to freezing in a few rural spots. But this compensated for by plenty of sunshine for many places across the UK to start the new working week. A few showers, though, breaking out quite quickly across parts of northern Scotland. And as the day goes on, we see the heating of the day. So the showers will break out 